Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this event at the Foundation for Science and Technology, uh, kindly hosted for us as so often by the Royal Society, which we do appreciate. Uh, welcome to you who are here physically and also welcome to our very substantial participation online on Zoom as well. Uh, and this is uh, a rather special event because it is being held in tribute to uh, John Selborne, the Earl of Selborne, uh, my predecessor as chairman of the Foundation for Science and Technology, a great advocate for science, uh, an extraordinarily capable but also courteous man, someone who played a very important role in the development of the Foundation for Science and Technology over 30 years, culminating in his time as chairman. He also served very actively as a member of the House of Lords, chairing the uh, Committee on Science and Technology twice. And he had a long commitment to science, I have to say, particularly to agricultural science. I can remember conversations with him he advising me on which apples to buy. He was definitely an apple expert. Uh, and uh, he worked with many organizations, some of whom are with us this evening, and we're most, most grateful to two of them uh, for sponsoring this event, the University of Southampton, of which he was, of course, a very distinguished chancellor, and also the Parliamentary Science and Technology Information Foundation. And if I may say so, we're particularly pleased that members of John's family have been able to join us this evening. A welcome to his wife, Joanne, and to his children, William, Emily and Luke. It's very good to see you here this evening. Um, throughout the evening, if people, when they intervene on this subject, which we thought was a natural for John, if you wish to share with us um, during the Q&A session and after dinner, if with any observations and reflections you have on John, that would be very welcome. And before we start the main discussion on where we go from COP26, uh, I'm very pleased that we're going to hear a short tribute to John from Alec Brewers, Lord Brewers. Alec, do join us. Thank you, David. It is, of course, a great privilege to do this it's a difficult thing to do as well because Gavin's only given me five and a half minutes. And, but in, in some ways that's useful because if one just started talking about John, one would go on for an hour at least. Um, so I've prepared just five minutes and I'm going to constrain myself as, uh, at, to the time that he was in the Lords, as I will explain. So John Roundell Palmer, the four, fourth Earl of Selborne, GBE, FRS, was born into a family that for a hundred years had been involved in government. And although it was assumed that he would devote his life to running the family's very large horticultural and agricultural estate, it was no surprise that he was drawn into politics when he was at Oxford. But I don't have time to do justice to his long and fascinating life story. Instead, I refer you to the very excellent obituary that's on the website. I'm going to limit my remarks to John's career in the House of Lords, although I only met him in 2004 when I became the chairman of the Science and Technology Select Committee. He'd already been in the Lords for 32 years. He first sat... <clears throat> in February 1972, after the death of his grandfather. His father had died in a military accident during the war. He was 32 years old, half the age of most in the house then, and it will be the same now. He delivered his maiden speech in July of 72 as a participant in a lengthy debate on a local government bill. He didn't follow the normal custom with maiden speeches of saying a few words about himself 
and staying away from controversy, he dived straight in and made a strong case for a much larger increase in the autonomy of local authorities than the bill was offering. And his speech drew compliments from all who followed him. For example, the Earl Waldgrave described it as an extremely able speech by all standards and predicted as many others did that he would make an invaluable contribution to the work of the House of Lords. And so he did. He rapidly became an authority, if not the authority on agricultural and horticultural affairs and was dedicated to preserving the environment. He also understood the issues posed by our membership of the European community. For instance, in 74, he sought to redress the damage done by French and Italian fruit growers who were, as he put it, planting irresponsibly well beyond the requirements of their own markets. At the same time, he pointed out that despite their actions, there was great optimism within the UK industry and that in as, insofar as apples are concerned, we could grow a commodity that was second to none. The apples he mentioned, of course, were Cox's and Bramley's. He had that happy way always of being a, real, a realist, but at the same time being optimistic. However, he was invariably modest about his knowledge and abilities, explaining that he was just a farmer. But of course, he was a very good and innovative farmer who made sure that he was up to date with the latest advances in science relating to farming. And farmers are anchored in reality. The results of their decisions and efforts clear for everyone to see, as they are, for example, for engineers and medical practitioners. It's difficult to balance the risks associated with innovation and change with the potential benefits they offer. He grew to understand this balance and indeed, indeed to the importance of science and technology as it related to the whole of society. He had yet another skill that perhaps he is most famous for, and that was his ability as a chairman his warmth and generosity and determination that everyone should contribute meant that people really enjoyed his chairmanship and gave it their best. Once again, he was very modest about this and would relate a story that I thought was probably not true and verified it beforehand. He would always say that Joanna said that he was mainly a good chairman because he had a loud voice. And he did have a loud and a clear voice. And what a marvelous thing it is to serve under a, a chairman of a committee when every word from the chair can be heard and understood. These meetings we knew very well, particularly when he was advising those who asked questions that if they limited themselves to two years, we would welcome it. This comprehensive, expertise on how to organize and found science and technological research and development, combined with his reputation as a first-class chairman, meant that by the 90s, he was in huge demand to lead inquiries and chair important committees. The list is long and impressive, as you can see in his obituary. I don't have time to mention it here. Notably, and he considered it one of his most important contributions, as David has said, he chaired the House of Lords Science and Technology Select Committee from 93 to 97, and again from 2014 through 2017, starting in 93 with an inquiry into the regulation of the United Kingdom biotechnology industry and global competitiveness, and ending more than a dozen inquiries later with one into connected and autonomous vehicles in 2017. He's the only person to chair the committee twice. Recognition of what he achieved gained him the highest rank amongst the Knights of the British Empire. And it was no surprise, of course, uh, that he was an obvious choice to chair the foundation of science and technology, 
as he had been working here, as it were, for many years beforehand. He took over when Lord Jenkin retired in 2006, and the foundation, of course, thrived and increased its influence under his chairmanship. Now, we all benefited from John's leadership. And his life, life is just not the same without his warmth, his friendship, and his support. We miss him terribly. Thank you very much indeed, Alec, for those uh, vivid reflections. Uh, and I must say that crisp instruction, keep it to five minutes, was typical of John. We carry on conducting an aff our affairs in that spirit. Um, so let us now turn to the uh, subject of today's event, COP26. Where do we go from here? We have four fantastic speakers. Our first speaker is joining us online. So I hope that we will hear in a moment from Professor Sadita Helm, who is Professor of Economic Policy at the University of Oxford, who is Independent Chair of the Natural Capital Committee, absolutely a subject close to John's heart, providing advice to the government on the sustainable use of natural capital until the end of the second term of the committee in November 2020. And he has recently been knighted for his services to the Environment, Energy and Utilities Policy. His most recent book was Net Zero, I hope, Dieter, that you can hear us and are able to join us now. Oh, wonderful. There you are. Welcome, Dieter. I can hear you very clearly. Thank I can hear you. you very clearly, John. Uh, uh, so shall I fire away? Right. Yes, I'll just hand over you. Now, just before I do that, let me make one other point, uh, which is, of course, a lot of people will be following on Zoom. Do use the Q&A function, not the chat function. Do use the Q&A function. Start putting in your questions in response to anything you hear from our four speakers, and then we'll move on to Q&A. Dieter, over to you. Well, thank you very much um, uh, for inviting me along this evening. Uh, it is a huge topic. Where do we go after COP26? Um, and I shall, in uh, uh, 10 minutes, try to set out uh, some uh, framework to that question. So I think the starting point of any discussion of what we do next is a clear understanding of the facts about where we are and a brutal realism about what has and has not been achieved. So if we look at the baseline where we are today, we are adding two parts per million per annum to the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. We have done that for the last 30 years without exception. Uh, 26 COPs, the 25 before in Glasgow, have so far made not a dent in that two parts per million. And it is very, very salutary to note that last year, despite all the lockdowns from uh, coronavirus um, uh, concerns, and despite the steep fall in emissions, we added another two parts per million to the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. And where we go from now must focus on the problem. And the problem is the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, not territorial carbon emissions, although they're part of it. And the problem is both sequestration and how our natural world absorbs carbon and emissions, not just emissions. So here we are. 26 COPs later, and um, we've had the same speeches. I have the quotes from used at each of the COPs in the past, and they're always the same about the turning point of history. We're saving the world. Um, this is the crunch point. It's a great moment. We've made great decisions. And the reality is that it's almost always the same. And here we are this time. So we have a series of NDCs, which are not legally binding. Um, and these NDCs have never been fully uh, met in the past, but just supposing they're met in the future, as long as the sequestration side of the equation doesn't, quote, misbehave, then we will get to over two parts, uh, two, two degrees warming, uh, at least, and some people suggest more. But of course, the lesson from last year is, even if you have radical cuts in emissions, you have to take into account 
all the stuff that's going on in the soils, in the natural environment, on the sequestration side, or what should be the sequestration side, to get the actual concentration effects in the atmosphere. A, st a scary fact uh, is that the Amazon is now a net emitter of carbon. So what did COP achieve? Well, apart from those NDCs, which don't fully add up, there were a series of other uh, component parts. But just on the NDCs, uh, climate change isn't going to be solved in England or London. It's going to be primarily solved in places like China, India, and Sub-Saharan Africa. China does not intend to commit to stopping increasing its emissions of carbon until 230 for another decade. It's already 30% of global emissions or almost 30%. And it's going to take another 30 years after that to get to something it calls carbon neutrality. India is going to take half a century to get to uh, net zero. That's, you know, thinking back to, um, uh, you know, Second World War to the end of the 20th century, huge time span and with no clear plan of how to get there. Uh, and in sub-Saharan Africa, it's not clear what the NDCs really mean, but this really matters. Nigeria might have a population bigger than Europe by the end of this century. What's going on there, the growth rates and what's being stripped out of the soils uh, and the uh, uh, natural sequestration capacity is awesome in the scary sense of the word. So if you think that this sort of process and another 26 cops are going to get us to uh, a place to go to in the future where we're going to decarbonize and stop global warming, I say you need to explain why one more heave of a process that hasn't worked for 30 years is going to work going forward. There are two, two or three other bits of COP. There's the great funding. Rightly, we in the West should pay to help uh, developing countries decarbonize because a lot of the stock of the carbon is ours up in the atmosphere. We've come up with the same number as at um, uh, Paris, $100 billion a year. And, and since Paris, it's been about 75 billion actual. And a lot of that is reclassifying existing aid. Well, just bear in mind that 75 billion per annum is the annual dividend of Saudi Aramco. That shows how serious we are. And on the forestry, same as 214, again, we're going to try to stop forestry in a decade by a decade's time, not now. And the destruction rate of the Amazon is faster than it's ever been. And 14 billion is part private, part public, and less than we've wasted on uh, an inefficient track and trace system for coronavirus in the UK. These are perspective points. Uh, there's a coal pledge, but actually uh, US, uh, China and India are not part of that. There's a methane pledge, but uh, key methane emitters are not part of that frame either. That's not to say these COPs aren't valuable, but where we go from this COP is not to build on its foundations. And what we need to look at quite hard is if we are to pursue a unilateral climate change policy for what is uh, explicitly a global problem, it really doesn't matter where the carbon's emitted. And if we want to get to a position in 250 where at least we in the UK no longer contribute to climate change, we will not be at that point if we achieve net zero as defined under the Climate Change Act. Quite the contrary, because it's very easy to think of quick ways of reducing territorial carbon emissions in the UK. Just close the rest of the steel industry tomorrow. Why not get rid of the six petrochemical plants? Why not hope Brexit finishes off the car industry? This will reduce emissions quite quickly. There'll be big numbers that come from these changes. And we could import the stuff instead. We'd have a huge tick in the box. We'd be the poster country for reducing emissions as the prime minister boasts regularly. But of course, we'd actually, in these particular examples, be increasing global warming because the steel might be produced in a more carbon intensive way in China than it is in the UK. So the only basis on which you can have a unilateral uh, uh, policy towards climate change, which produces the result that we are no longer contributing to climate change, if that is what we want to do, and there are good moral reasons for thinking why we should, is to have a carbon consumption basis. We should treat 
all our consumption, our carbon footprint, whether domestic or through imports, on the same basis, because it is all carbon to the atmosphere. And uh, the obvious way to do that is a carbon border adjustment. We should also look in within this country to find the cheapest ways of achieving that outcome. And that means applying a carbon price, not just to the uh, energy intensive sectors and power, but to the other sectors of the economy, agriculture, transport, and heating in particular. And I note with dismay that the government's effectively ruled out an extension of the UK ETS to these areas for fear of the consequences to consumer bills that might follow from this. Just shows the commitment is skin deep. Bills come first, commitment to climate change comes second. And as we go into a spring in which the energy bill issue and the so-called crisis in the cost of living is gonna be at the top of the political agenda, the difference between the rhetoric of all the uh, bold and exciting um, uh, ambitions and targets and the reality on the ground is stark. And that leads also to the need for an honesty with the population as to what the costs of decarbonisation are. It is fashionable to say it isn't going to cost very much. That's nonsense. But it's even worse. It's fashionable to say, and uh, I actually heard uh, the uh, opposition spokesman on this make this statement, though I've heard it from uh, uh, across the spectrum, that it's worth paying the costs of reducing emissions because the costs of mitigation are, are much lower than the costs of the damage climate change is going to do. Well, I'm very much in favour of in incurring those costs, but anyone who deludes themselves that if the UK achieves net zero, we will not face the costs of global warming doesn't understand that global warming doesn't just happen in London or England, but is a global phenomenon. We are going to get both sets of costs and we have to pre prepare the population for those costs. So I would like after COP26 to cut the rhetoric, to cut the uh, bold uh, uh, speeches and to turn towards a brutal reality about the facts and explain to the population what it means to no longer cause climate change. I'm an inveterate optimist, so I believe the population will uh, see that this is the reality of what's on the table. They must see it already. The estimates for replacing, you know, household gas boilers with heat pumps <laughs> are not trivial. They're enormous for households, particularly in the lower part of the distribution. These are just the beginning of what it takes to convert an overwhelmingly fossil fuel economy into a low carbon economy going forward. But that's what we must do, and that must, that's what we must uh, take forward. And um, if we do that, of course, there are great opportunities of pushing this forward. But what we don't want to hear is politicians like Obama, who told the world in his State of the Union speech what a fantastic achievement it was under his presidency to increase fracking in the United States, to dramatically increase gas production and reduce the price to below two uh, uh, $2 uh, BTUs and to massively increase the oil production more than any other president had achieved for decades and then to preach to the young at Glasgow how important it was for leaders, leaders like him to engage in decarbonisation. You know we can't point in both directions, we need an honesty and we need to realise that for all the hype around COP26 it is not a sound foundation for taking things forward. This is a very, very serious situation. Climate will warm uh, almost certainly well beyond the two degree target. And we have to get real about finding ways of bottom up incentivizing people to act. And the great advantage of a carbon consumption approach and a carbon border tax is of course, any country exporting that steel to say the UK, when their ship arrives at the docks at say Southampton, they can of course ask, how can I get out of paying the carbon price? And the answer is, bring us an exemption certificate that shows you paid the carbon price to your own government. It's a no brainer that exporters of the UK would rather pay their own governments than HM Treasury. And that is the way to pluralize from a coalition of the willing based on carbon consumption, using carbon border adjustments, 
a bigger and bigger coalition of the imposition of a carbon price more generally around the world. That isn't sufficient, but I think it's necessary. And that's what we should have been talking about in Glasgow, not um, the hype that um, we were all uh, 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 possibly a bit seduced by. So there's a pathway to do this. It's not the COP pathway. Good to have George Orr, but let's get on with the reality of really doing what it takes to no longer cause climate change, at least in this country. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Dieter, for those very challenging remarks. Uh, and good to see a bit of subtle product placement as well, with net zero nestle, nestling above Adam Smith, so uh, <laughs> above your shoulder. So it's great. Thank you so much. I hope you are going to be able to stay with us for a while. I know you're, you're busy, but if you want to hear the other uh, interventions and then participate in the Q&A, that would be fantastic. Uh, and our next speaker is Professor Ian Boyd, currently a professor at the University of St Andrews, chair of the UK Research Integrity Office. Uh, he was chief scientific advisor to the UK government on food and the environment from 2012 to 2019 uh, and is uh, a fellow member of the board of UKRI. Ian, thank you very much. Over to you. Uh, oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, David. Um, and uh, it probably won't come as a surprise uh, that, that I'm going to say quite a lot of this similar things to what Dieter has just, just said, but I'll say them in, in different terms. I'm a sort of practical kind of guy, and um, uh, I want to try to uh, illustrate some of the, the what next issues around uh, climate change through uh, two lenses. Uh, one is a lens that I have uh, in my role uh, at the University of St Andrews, where I'm responsible for uh, trying to change the business model of the university in such a way as to become a net zero institution. Uh, and the second is as co-chair with Nicola Sturgeon of the Scottish Environment Council. Um, and the reason for looking at it through those two lenses is that um, I think collectively, uh, as institutions across the country, when I say institutions, I mean, uh, everything from local authorities to uh, SMEs to large corporates and uh, institutions like universities. Um, those, those collectively have to uh, get to net zero if the country is going to get to net zero. So giving you an illustration of what's actually happening inside an institution uh, like a university uh, might help a little bit understand, to understand what some of the challenges are. And then secondly, um, those challenges can be scaled up uh, in such a way that they, they can be looked at from a national scale. And actually my experience so far is that there is not a lot of difference between the kind of uh, challenges there are in the institutional scale and the kind of challenges at the national scale. The results are slightly different, but they do, they, they do interact. Um, now I have a number of slides um, that I'm going to go through here. Um, and I'm starting with this one because um, it, 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 I, I think this is about the next generation. It's about young people. Um, and uh, it's about trying to do something that to help help them. Um, and one of the, the big key learnings I have from working in a university structure is that I'm working alongside students and they are absolutely passionate about wanting to change things. Um, uh, and much more so than actually I think my generation is. And they are really imaginative and they're really up for it. And this is uh, just uh, a number of the students that I, I actually work with at, at the university. And I said that um, I think there's an interaction between what happens at an institutional level and at a, at a, at a national level. Um, and I think there are um, a number of questions we can ask here, and that's what, what do institutions need to do? Um, what do national governments need to do? do uh, and how do they interact? Um, uh, that national governments need to create a policy landscape that is going to uh, allow not just institutions but individual citizens to actually make the, make the choices that are required in order to be able to get us to net zero. So let me just look at the institutional context first of all. Um, I've put a graph up here showing the sort of track for an institution. It happens to be the institution that I'm involved with but it could be any institu institution towards net zero. 
And there are a number of messages um, sitting inside this graphic. Um, and I think the first one is that um, it's a long track. This is going to out to 2035 because that's what strategically the institution involved here, which is the University of St Andrews, has decided to do is to get to net zero by 2035. But one of the key learnings is that that's really hard work. Um, uh, 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 my institution happens to have uh, uh, got the, uh, the Institution of the Year Award for a sustainable institution, uh, sustainable university, but it only got that actually not because of the progress it's made, but because actually it's facing up to the realities of what that really means. Um, what I've certainly learned from having done this uh, or, or been involved in it is that when I hear uh, the talk about net zero, and it is just talk, most of it is greenwash. Um, the reality is getting an institution to net zero is extremely hard work. You need to change the culture of the institution from top to bottom. Um, you need to include scope three emissions. Um, this idea that you only get to net zero in scope one and scope two um, is, is a complete fiction. If everybody did that, then we would never get anywhere at all. We need to include scope three, and that is an ethical re requirement. And I can tell you within a university context, the students absolutely insist on that. Um, so the business model needs to, be, needs to change. And what does that really mean? Well, for a university, that means by 2030, 2040, we've got to be doing things very, very differently from the way we do it at the moment. And the challenge I give to the university court is that actually I think your state's gonna be half, about half the size it is now uh, by 2040. And you have to plan to get there by, by then. You also have to plan, by the way, to absorb carbon. Just, just getting carbon out of your inventory is not enough. You are going to have to absorb it. And it's actually sitting in this graph here. It's the brown line at the bottom that comes up to meet the, um, uh, the, 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 the carbon emission line. Uh, and a university like St Andrews has to uh, absorb about 40,000 tonnes of carbon by 2035 it if it wants to get to net zero. That is the size of the challenge. The statute reporting is ineffective. It doesn't really provide any incentive to the universities at all. So it's, 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 it's something that needs to change. And what's more, we have a regulatory playing field that is almost non-existent. Um, so, so government is not helping. And actually, I've put a quote in here from my assistant, who, who just in exasperation said that there's a sense from people here that we have to get things right uh, within the institution, but there is no government cavalry coming across the, across the hill. Um, so basically, institutions like the University of St Andrews are not getting the help that they need uh, from government, and that's policy help. So I now want to turn to the national context where that policy help can be implemented. Um, but I, the, the first point I want to make is that I think COP26 asked the wrong question. It asked how, how can we get greenhouse gas uh, uh, um, uh, concentrations in the atmosphere down. We will never get greenhouse gas con con concentrations in the atmosphere down unless we reduce consumption, because it's a mass balance problem. Um, it, the more we consume, the more pollution we create. And part of that pollution is obviously greenhouse gases. Um, this is domestic extraction, but trading extraction is, is, is the same, is the same, same overall trends. They are upwards and they're accelerating overall. These are global at the global scale. Material productivity is declining overall. Um, there's increasing evidence of resource exhaustion. I can go into that later on. I know that's disputed, but there is increasing evidence of, of resource exhaustion. Uh, and there's some evidence of declining returns on investment in innovation. So we're, we're paying more to run faster and go backwards, unfortunately. Um, and, and, and within that context, in Scotland at least, and I think it's pretty much the same for the UK and probably for the whole of Europe, each person consumes about 18 tonnes of raw materials a year, and we need to get that below eight tonnes in order to become sustainable. Um, now, that creates a policy problem. It's how do you, how do you deal with that is the, is, is the question. Just extending that slightly uh, a, a little bit more and, and to be a little bit more pessimistic, um, this, is the, 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 this graph comes from the World 3 model and it's the, it's the update from the limits to growth um, uh, scenarios that, that, that were run in the early 1970s, but it's been updated um, 
uh, relatively recently. Uh, this is the highest, this is the most plausible scenario for the globe um, looking forward based on the data that we currently exist under those systems dynamic models, showing populations, uh, population change, but also showing, showing resources and showing pollution, pollution rising very rapidly um, and uh, um, industrial output falling extremely rapidly sometimes through the 2030s and, uh, or, and 2050s. Now, this, I think, can be looked upon as a reasonable worst case scenario. But those of you who have been in government know that you plan for the reasonable worst case scenario. Are we planning for this scenario? Absolutely not. We can say that, well, technological innovation and investment in technology might change this, uh, and it will change it slightly, but not, in, but, but not by enough in order to be able to uh, uh, resolve that kind of problem. This is fundamentally saying the same as Dieter said, but in a broader context, in that this isn't just about greenhouse gases, it's about how we manage the resources of the planet and how we reduce pollution uh, at the same time. So within a national context, what do we do about this? Well, the current policy context looks a bit like this. We have a whole load of su supply side policies that we love to, to use. Uh, and that's about, uh, about investing in research and innovation. Um, it's about market solutions, it's about deregulation, it's about subsidy, uh, and that includes uh, uh, fossil fuel subsidies, uh, by the way. Um, and we have a relatively small amount of demand side policies about regulation, fiscal policy, and incentivization. Of course, the illustration that Dieter gave about border controls and things like that are about uh, in, in including certain, certain kinds of demand side policies there. Um, and we, I could go into, uh, into more detail about what those demand side policies might look like. Obviously, carbon taxes are, 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 all, part of, are, are all part of that. But they are hard to implement, and politicians don't like implementing them because fundamentally, it's about saying to people, well, you want this, but you can't have it, and I'm going to make it difficult for you to have it. Um, but we need, we need to face up to that, and that's, I, I think that's, that aligns with what Dieter was saying, and we need to balance off the supply side with the demand side policies. It's not a matter of reducing the supply side policies because actually some of them are very good. It's just that we know we need to balance them up and we're not doing that. Uh, we need to internalize the environmental costs. Um, and what, we, what I'm trying to do with the First Minister of Scotland is take us through that journey about what those policy changes might be uh, in order to be able to make that balance uh, happen better. And as a result, provide better, a better policy framework for institutions like the University of St Andrews, but all the others as well, in, uh, uh, to be able to contribute um, uh, to, that, uh, uh, to that objective. So what next? Well, um, I personally think the machinery of government needs to change in order to reflect that's the size of that challenge. Um, I don't think, I, and this goes to exactly what Dieter was saying, you know, we have failed um, uh, actually repeatedly to be able to, to, to step up to this challenge. Uh, whether the machinery of government is enough to change this is another matter. Um, policy innovation is just, uh, 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 policy innovation needs to be seen as being just as important as technology innovation. I think we tend to move to technology innovation as our solution, but actually policy innovation is really important and technology innovation will not work unless we have policy innovation alongside it. Um, and as I've already said, I think we need to have policies that, that, that empower institutions and individuals to do the job uh, in a market-based uh, context. Uh, and for, finally, I think we really do need to um, uh, acknowledge that sustainability is more than just net zero carbon. Uh, if we get to 2050 and we get to net zero, I don't think we'll turn around and think we've solved the problem. Uh, I think the problem will still be with us and it'll just be in another form. And I'll leave you with that site, which is the students at the University of St Andrews protesting uh, against what's going on uh, in the world around us at the moment. Uh, and I think that we need to do something about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, our next 
speaker is uh, Barbara Young, Baroness Young of uh, Old Scone. She is chair of the Woodland Trust and chair of the council at the Royal Veterinary College. Uh, she has served as chief executive of the RSPB, chairman of English Nature, chief executive of the Environment Agency. Interests that very much overlap with John's, of course. And I have happy memories of Barbara when she was running a health authority and I was on the board of it. Uh, but that must have been at least half a dozen reorganizations ago, Barbara. A lot has moved on since then. Thank you very much for coming along this evening, and we look forward to hearing from you. Good evening. David didn't tell the best bit of the story, which is I persuaded him to come onto my health authority because he used to talk from the heights of abstract policy. And I said to him, what a load of rubbish you talk about the health service. Come on to a proper health authority and we'll show you how it really works. Well, he was on my board for four years and at the end of it, he was still talking at this level. <laughs> but, we'd had, but we'd had fun during that time. Which, um, which is, is also what, what um, I think is my abiding memory of, of John Selborne. and I'm delighted to be here to talk uh, during this tribute to him tonight. He was a gentle and persuasive colleague, uh, but he played a major role in agriculture and, and the environment and in research uh, in the UK. My first meeting with him was when I was chief executive of the uh, uh, RSPB, and I drove him to the station after the meeting and we got into conversation about apples. And before I knew what was happening, he had demanded to be taken to my orchard and had actually uh, identified all of my ancient apple trees um, and put little notes on each of them to make sure that I understood what species they were. So that was terrific. Very John. So um, if this is the sort of post-match analysis of COP26, um, it very definitely went to extra time. Uh, India and China scored in the penalty shootout when the otherwise excellent referee Alex Sharma temporarily lost control of the match. The small island states, uh, alas, um, otherwise known for the purposes of this football analogy as Latvia, um, lost comprehensively. Uh, though overall much seemed to be delivered, and I'm going to be slightly more optimistic than uh, these two miserable souls in front of me. Um, <laughs> And, and talk about some of the things that I think COP26 did deliver and then leave some messages for the government. Um, the completion of the Paris rule book is not exactly something that everybody talks about over breakfast, but that was an important deliverable, setting the framework of rules for carbon markets and hopefully encouraging people to be more ambitious about their enhanced nationally determined contributions since they know what the rules are. It, it, more countries than ever before were involved in, in the COP process and, and more have signed up to net zero, even India after a fashion. Coal was included in the Glasgow Climate Pact for the first time in a heavily diluted way, but at least it's a start. And we all know that 1.5 degrees can't be achieved while the world, world still burns coal. The side deals were probably more important than the main gig with methane and halting deforestation as, in, as important parts of that, but they of course lack any of the formal monitoring and reporting mechanisms that the COP26 process applies. But there were sterling efforts behind the scenes uh, and that meant 133 countries did sign up to the deforestation deal. Now we here in the UK now need to show an example by not destroying or damaging our remaining fragments of important forest, our ancient woodland. There are still over a thousand ancient woodland areas under threat in the UK. The joint issue of a statement by China and the US was an interesting uh, development. I suppose it's the equivalent of the process in Parliament when the two chief whips confer behind the wool sack uh, we watch to see what these unusual as opposed to usual channels uh, deliver. And there were some bits of process that I think are encourage encouraging. Business for this COP didn't send the deputy post boy, but actually chairman and chief execs who were there in force. The commitment to come back next year with enhanced national contributions 
signals a ratcheting up process, which is welcome. And if we're back to football again, GFANS, which is um, an acronym for the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, has now doubled the assets globally under management for tackling the climate crisis. It's a small beginning, but it's a beginning. Of course, there were things that others have talked about that didn't come through the $100 billion funding per annum funding commitment wasn't reached, the compensation for poorer countries and small island states for the impact of our pollution uh, is still unresolved. And though nature-based solutions were talked about a lot, there were less mechanisms for their delivery uh, uh, and very little link up between COP15, the Biodiversity Convention, and COP26. Now, it is absolutely axiomatic that one and a half degrees can't be delivered without restoring our biodiversity. And of course, adaptation uh, did have some time in the sun. Uh, the budget was doubled, but that was doubling not very much at all. Uh, and though I welcome the agreement for a two year process for a global plan for adaptation, uh, it's another two years. Uh, because the point has already been made that adaptation is going to be increasingly important and not just in Bangladesh and the small island states uh, and in the increasingly arid regions, but, but here with extreme weather events, with uh, uh, fires, droughts, floods, plagues of locusts, slaughtering of the firstborn. Um, but the reality is it's also going to be about immigration that immigration pressure is going to increase as the populations of the world seek uh, a living elsewhere uh, when their territory becomes increasingly hostile due to climate change impacts. And we will feel that pressure growing as we are already experiencing. So there were lots of agreements made at COP26, but will they be implemented? Who knows? So what next? Let me offer a plan for our government for the next 12 months. I'm not going to look ahead. 2050, I'm just going to be focused on the task in hand for our government. First of all, we are the president for the next year. This is a game of two halves and we've got the second half still to come. Alex Sharma will need to re-energize the process, make sure the enhanced NDCs come forward, make sure that China and the US talking does have some impact and try and knock India into shape. He needs to ensure processes for the implementation of the commitments that have been made, particularly the side deals. And he made, made, needs to make sure that we get over the line on the 100 billion annual funding, which may not be that huge amount of money, but it is a sign to uh, the small island states and the emerging world uh, that, that at least some action is being taken by those who caused the historic pollution. And of course, he needs to make sure that the promises of private sector funding are leveraged. Back in the UK, we need to lead by example. So I want to give the government an easy start with six examples that they could set. First of all, we need a zero, zero carbon and biodiversity tests for all policies right across the board. In my select committee on science and technology, which I'm a member of, we interviewed uh, government departments about their uh, plans for COP26. And I, mu I must admit, I fell apart at the seams when the evidence came in uh, from the uh, education department where clearly they had no concept that education could play a role in climate change. It was unbelievable. So zero carbon and biodiversity tests for all policies. No more trade agreements without climate change parity being a precondition. If our farmers and our businesses are to meet climate change standards, we shouldn't be signing trade agreements with countries that don't. And that's bad for our companies and it's bad for the planet. The third example the government can give is a strategic land use framework to make sure that we use that scarce resource of land most effectively for sequestration, for trees and peat to sequester carbon, especially with my hat as the Woodland Trust, the right tree in the right place and at a fast pace. But we also need a land use framework uh, to make sure that we can deliver the transition, the transition to lower emissions, including methane from food production. 
especially reduction in meat and dairy and increases in plant-based food as outlined in the national food strategy, while still retaining a vibrant and, and economically uh, viable farming industry. My fourth uh, example that the government could give um, is that we need uh, not a scattergun of initiatives, but a properly sustained action plan with timescales and funding and transparent pathways that can be monitored uh, for our highest carbon and greenhouse gas emitting areas, energy, building, transport and agriculture. And the zero, the net zero strategy is not that. It's got holes all over it, as those of you who have read uh, the recent report um, uh, from the Aldersgate Great Group will know. And one simple little thing, for heaven's sake, DEFRA, and I shall use a technical term at this point, get the finger out. Uh, we and farmers have waited far too long for the environmental land management scheme to be born. One thing we do need to guard against, however, is that uh, we don't let the government off the hook. They are putting too much faith in some key technologies, uh, and particularly, in my view, in green hydrogen, uh, which is some way away, but is worryingly crucial to many of the elements of the net zero strategy. Generally speaking, the government over-focuses on the white hot heat of technology, on hydrogen, on CCSU, and not enough on fiscal and taxation changes uh, to reduce the price of climate friendly technologies and increase the, the price of polluting goods and services, because we do need to foster and encourage substantial behavior change uh, that public and businesses need to make. My fifth example that the government should give is that all public procurement should adopt zero carbon targets. Public procurement is a huge lever to drive the development of climate friendly goods and services. And it's not just in things that public authorities buy, but, but the whole market is conditioned by the size of that spending power. No government has really ever uh, used that lever effectively, and the climate crisis says that we must. Uh, my sixth example is possibly the mo most important, um, because I don't think the Chancellor quite gets climate change. Most of the big changes we need to make in the UK need not just upfront funding, but more importantly, fiscal and taxation measures. We don't yet have a climate change commitment from the Treasury. Their analysis that accompanied the net zero strategy was all about other government departments and not about the Treasury's philosophy. Rishi Sunak needs to show that he has a more ambitious and thought through strategy beyond modest funding for the new technology development and implementation like heat pumps and new nuclear and e-cars and whatever the latest announcement was this week. Uh, and he needs to set an example now in terms of stopping damaging subsidies by stopping the massive subsidy to Drax in inappropriate biomass extraction, which is adversely impacting on international biodiversity. But perhaps the most crucial thing for the future is twofold. One is ensuring that the system delivers a transition that is just now, this is not just an ethical point, um, both globally and nationally, but it's a practical point. In my view, there are already signs of individuals and farmers and business people getting into their heads that net zero measures all have an unacceptable upfront cost, which impacts most severely on business, on the poor, on whoever. And if that takes a hold, we will all fail. And secondly, we absolutely uh, must keep faith with young people. We saw the power of young people to move mountains. They're gonna inherit this mess. Their line in the sand that you saw on the slides. If we don't keep faith with that huge power of young voices, they will not forgive us and we will not win through. Thank you.
Thank you uh, very much indeed, Barbara. And now, uh, and for those practical proposals at the end, now let's go straight on to our fourth and final speaker, Professor Sir Giles Godfrey, Director of the Oxford Martin School, Professor of Population Biology at Oxford, uh, has chaired the UK Government Office of Child Sciences Foresight Project on the Future of Food and Farming, and who is also chair of the UK's Agriculture and Environment Ministries Science Advisory Council. So Charles, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much indeed, David. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to uh, do things at the foundation. It's a particular pleasure to do it on the uh, day we remember John Selborne. Um, I got to know John when I had the privilege of being uh, on the board of trustees of Q under John, and what little skill I have as a chair these days, I learned at uh, John's feet. And I also interacted with John and with Joanna um, when I chaired for the Royal Society, the Southeast Asian Rainforest Research Program. And John and Joanna visited the program a few years back and astounded the local Malaysian guides and things by their fitness and ability to climb in tropical weathers up very steep muddy uh, slopes. So it's lovely to see John's family here. Um, it's always a problem coming last. I started with a 10 minute talk. I've got about two minutes left once uh, all the important things have been said. Um, I share a lot of Dieter's concern right at the beginning. Um, Dieter, uh, and I do encourage you to read Dieter's blog where he, um, which he published recently, where he takes some of these ideas and um, ex ex extends them. And his point about the relentless two parts per million drumbeat of increasing carbon dioxide going in the atmosphere is really important. Of course, we don't know what it would be in the absence of the COP process. It could be worse, but it's a very sobering fact. But in the sort of dichotomy between the first two speakers and the second two speakers, I'm going to try and put some of the cases for the defense, sort of being uh, on the same side with Barbara and then try and be positive about some things that have come out of COP. And I, I, I think we should also realize that if you go back a year ago, there were a number of people, me included, in the community who were really worried about the whole process of COP and that the UK, whether the UK could pull it off. And I think it's a credit for Alex Sharma, Peter Hill, and their team that they, that they, um, that it came, that it had the, limited success that it, it, it did. It certainly wasn't a car crash. So Barbara's already mentioned some of, a, of what I think are the positive things that came out, some of which are quite nerdy, the sort of uh, improvement on the uh, Paris rule book, uh, an increasingly large number of countries committing to uh, NDCs. Um, one hopes India will go much better, but the mere fact that they've set NDCs, and Dieter's right, 50 years is a long way ahead, but hopefully now that it's there, it can be ratcheted up in the future. And the fact that it's now written into the, um, into the final communique and things that we do need a 45% reduction in greenhouse gases um, by 2030, and that we really need to reaffirm what Paris said about 1.5, um, I think it's good. I think that there is positive movements on trying to get carbon markets to work, not completely positive, but going in the right direction. Um, I would reiterate something that Dieter said about the importance about putting a price on carbon and doing carbon um, border adjustments. Um, there's been interesting progress in the European community over the last six months, nine months on that. Again, you could wish for it to be faster but you can imagine a, um, a good direction of change there. And I very much hope that we in the UK align with that and that we don't have a sort of Brexit huff about a really good initiative that is coming out of Europe. Um, but of course, against that positive side, one uh, can see a number of negatives, the glacial progress on funding, both Barbara and Dieter mentioned, we, we should be transferring $100 billion from the rich to the poor world to help for mitigation and adaptation, and that's just not happening. And I think looking ahead to COP27, to Sharm El Sheikh, this sort of um, geographic equity is going to be such an important issue there. 
We have the complex issue of the uh, loss and damage fund, which was discussed, but not very much at Glasgow. And I follow two Scottish speakers, and I would point out that the only two countries that have actually made a positive contribution to the loss and damage fund is Scotland and Wallonia, which is an interesting pairing. Um, just while we're on this uh, national thing, there, there are a variety of consortia of the willing, including beyond oil and gas that Wales signed up for, but not Scotland in that case. Um, and what also worries me are the geopolitical headwinds. We can see that the China are engaged in COP26, but not as much as one would have hoped. Yes, it was great that there was a China-US um, uh, joint statement and joint agreement, but I think even as experienced a diplomat as Kerry rather hoped that China would be able to set aside climate change and discuss with America, discuss with, with um, other countries, separate from all the other things that China uh, is concerned about. And I don't think that, that came about, about. And that's, a, I think, a chastening um, bit of political reality there. Um, I want to mention a couple of the initiatives that came out on the sides of COP. Um, the alliance that Mark Carney got together, 400 companies, uh, financial in, uh, institutions to align to net zero is good. Um, those companies are responsible for $130 trillion of assets under management. Now, if that is genuinely aligned to net zero, that will make a difference. Um, I think there is a real air of change in the private sector about wanting to move in this direction. Certainly not uniformly, certainly there's a lot of greenwashing about, but I think if one casts one mind, one's mind back even five or 10 years ago, the direction of progress is really positive. For example, a number of, of companies that are engaging in science-based targets and setting net zero. Um, as Barbara said, the initiatives on forests is good. And yes, we've been there before in 2014, but more countries are involved. There is some real money going in there. Um, forests are complex and Barbara's right that it lacks the legal enforceability of the main COP process. Um, but there's enormous progress that has been made in our ability to monitor deforestation in real time, which I think is, is hopeful, um, encouraging. And 75% of avoided emissions from forestry occur in just three countries, Brazil, Congo, and Indonesia. So by concentrating on those, um, on those three countries, which makes it, all countries have their own, all th of those three countries have their own great challenges, but at least one can get a lot of traction just by um, engaging with a limited number of countries. And it was good that the UK put in an investment of 500 million towards protecting forests. Um, yes, it's great on methane to have a commitment of a 30% reduction by 2030, but we actually need 45%. Um, again, as I think uh, Barbara said, China, Russia, and India were not amongst them. And if you look into the weeds of what the methane declaration is, there is a lot of really good stuff on the technological um, innovations that one might have in order to reduce methane from gas pipelines, to reduce it from livestock. But it is a shame that they shy away from some of the difficult things, including diet change, that we will just have to have if we have any hope of reducing methane. And methane, because it's a short-lived gas, can make a real difference. Methane is going to be essential if we have any hope of keep, keeping before uh, 1.5. Um, I'm particularly interested in food. I think there's been, um, food has been rather outside the COP processes over the years. I think that it was more central to this COP than previous COPs. There were a series of announcements from the UK, which, um, are modest, but I think really exciting. 25 million pounds going into the CG system, this wonderful system of uh, international laboratories responsible for the green revolution and have been starved of funds over the, over the last 10 years. 
There's the US UA UAE initiative, the Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate, which has now attracted four billion pounds. We desperately need more research and investment going into agriculture and to a modern type of agricultural research, which seeks not just to increase yields, but to increase sustainable, uh, sustainability there. So I think there were a suite of interesting innovations coming out there. I like the fact that nature and, si and climate are now more closely linked together. I think it's great that the UK is committing 40 million pounds for a global centre on biodiversity and climate. But then looking on the other side, this is all great, but Ian's exactly right. It is easy to make these, these um, commitments and excitements and boosterism on the supply side, but we're shying away from some of the hard issues. Again, when it comes to food and diet, on diets, and then the political hard issues. Completely agree with Barbara on what she said about uh, how we sign trade agreements. And the pervasive subsidies, which we all know about in the energy sector, but are almost as pervasive in the food sector and are acting against sustainability. Um, and I'm going to finish up by, uh, I can't quite match Barbara's six points for, uh, for um, what the UK might do. And I'm going to concentrate on one, which partially overlaps with one of the things uh, that she says, that, that, she, that, that she pointed out. Um, the government has made a series of really quite interesting commitments on biodiversity, on net zero, on what they want from our rural e economies. And I'm concerned that these don't quite add up together, or they might add up, but it's going to be harder to get them to add up. So exactly as Barbara says, we need to have a land use framework in order that we can try and titrate these different commitments and just see whether we can make them. Um, whatever you thought about Brexit, we're out of the, the European community and we can do different things with the money we used to put into our rural economies, it, rural economies through the CAP. And I think that DEFRA, during the time when Ian was chief uh, scientific advisor there, in a document rather curiously called Health and Harmony, um, came up with in my view, what was probably the most interesting document to have come out of an environment and farming ministry since the last war. And this was a commitment to net zero. And I think the commitment to net zero and the possibility of completely reformulating the way we support our rural, rural uh, uh, economy to produce a multitude of public goods as well as private goods. And public goods, they're really in the economist definition of public goods. It is wrong as you hear politicians say, well, food is a public good. Food is good for the public. It's not technically a public good. And I think until we get that right, it's gonna be very hard for us to talk to other countries and lecture other countries. We really do have an opportunity to do something that has major effects for both climate and for biodiversity. And Barbara mentioned it, and every farmer or farming organization that I talk to say, well, tell us what is going to happen. And exactly in the same way as the Bank of England will now give forward guidance about interest rate policies in the future, we're crying out for forward guidance about exactly how public money for public goods is going to work its way through to the to, to the system. So forgive me for repeating many of the very good points the previous speakers have said. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Charles. Can I invite uh, Barbara and Ian to come up and join us on the panel, please, uh, for fascinating presentations of which we're very grateful and some really uh, important points from the challenge for all of us here involved with particular institutions and bodies just to think of our responsibilities for trying to make sure that they are net zero right through so many fascinating points to, to ending on those reflections on food and methane um, so do raise your hands. We have a roving mic, and I'm going to try to log on as well to collect, make sure that I'm collecting Q&A 
interventions from our online participants as well. So I would encourage those. But who is there in the room who would like to set the ball rolling with a comment or question? Let's come down towards the front here. Yes, and the microphone is being brought with you. Now, I think there's a, for Royal Society, for COVID reasons, the aim is, yes, I should have explained this. I think the aim is to, for the microphone will be held by our assistant at an arm's length rather than handed over to you. And that is more COVID compliant. Is that right? So this is COVID compliant microphone holding. Uh, yeah. Thank you, David. Philip Greenish, uh, University of Southampton. Uh, first of all, thank you to the speakers for fascinating and mostly yeah. rather impressive talks. <laughs> Let's start with you, Barbara, and then I'll work our way along now, Matt. Thank you, Philip. Um, I'm sure Greta would say blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> and she might well be right. Um, but we need, you know, we can't, we can't just say we're all doomed. We're all doomed, I think. <laughs> That's Ian's speciality. Um, <laughs> you've got to have a Scottish accent. For it. <laughs> um, I do think that um, the people power that young people are representing at the moment is quite is quite strong. Even if they don't by uh, marching and objecting and taking days off school and stuff like that, they are very shortly going to be in positions of influence and power and work and work. I mean, the universities are being held; their feet are being held to the fire by their students on this issue of climate change mm -hmm. and sustainability. So that's a, a good step in the right direction. Um, and many of these uh, kids who are in their teens now will be very soon beginning to become influential in the world of work. And so I think that I have hope that the next generation who absolutely get climate change and sustainability and biodiversity restoration are probably the only hope since we screwed up fairly substantially. But we've got to keep moving until they come through the system. And, and thank you very much, Barbara. With my interest in intergenerational issues, there is a fascinating set of calculations that I, I cite in my book on exactly what has to happen to carbon dioxide emissions. And essentially, every, every baby boomer, and I do see one or two in the audience here, born between 45 and 65, will, we will, in the course of our lives, for European baby boomers, have emitted about 700 tonnes of carbon dioxide each. And you then work through for each birth cohort what they have to do to get hold us to 1.5 or 2. And the younger generation, born since the millennium, have, have got to emit an absolute maximum of 100 tonnes of carbon dioxide. So there's a massive change in the environmental impact of successive cohorts. So no wonder they're very focused on what needs to be done by them and, and how little we have done. Now, Ian, over to you. Well, um, I, I, Barbara, I don't think we're all doomed. Um, um, uh, but I, I think that, that what we don't often understand is the, is the size of the challenge that we have ahead. And I think what David has just said quoted uh, in terms of numbers it represents that and we've had it had it uh, you know in, in a variety of forms this evening um, and I think what the populist tradition and people like Greta Thunberg actually uh, managed to do is to transmit their real concern that actually uh, the, the other part of the community that are not out there protesting um, many of us really do not fully grasp the, the gravity of the challenge and you know when I said that an institution like I represent needs to change its business model actually we need to change the business model of the nation as well that's the problem that we face and of course it's it's almost an insurmountable challenge it's 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 so huge we can't get our arms around it that's that's our problem and that's why I was saying actually we 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 probably need some form of machinery of government change in order to be able to grasp this 
I don't know exactly what that would look like, but um, it's at that level. Um, otherwise, the kind of scenario that I put up, uh, which is the world three sort of dynamic model, um, becomes more likely. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we, we need to head off from that uh, and we need to head off as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Charles. My office in Central Oxford looks out over where the school kids used to demonstrate for climate change, against climate change on Fridays. And it's wonderful seeing them out there and then aged professors like me walking by and clapping them as they were doing. And I think that movement from uh, Greta Thunberg and uh, from younger people it is really instrumental in changing the, uh, in changing the mood music. If, if I have a concern, it's the relentless negativity, and I think that there is a skill in not shying away from the enormity of the task ahead, but giving hope and giving an example of what can be done. And uh, I hope that someone as wonderful and mm. as influential as Greta Thunberg mm. could actually do that as well as raising consciousness about, um, about the challenges ahead. Yeah, I think that's very wise advice. And, and of course, it, it relates, it's very interesting, it relates to uh, increasing concerns about things like mental health. If people are just told everything's terrible, but aren't given any practical steps that they particularly think they've got control over to make things better, that is far worse for them than if they think there is some practical initiative yeah. in their lo local school or whatever, yeah. which they can do to help. It completely transforms their approach and is, is far better. I, no. think, I think we yes, ought to ban glue. Hmm? I think we ought to ban glue. Oh, gluing, yeah. gluing yourself oh, to anything. All right. Oh, all oh, right. We're not, we're not going to do that this evening. <laughs> 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 yes, exactly. <laughs> it does strike me that people with perfectly valid and, and, and absolutely admirable views can get themselves on the wrong side of yeah. everything if they yeah. glue themselves to tube trains. Yep, <laughs> right. No, no gluing to trains, right. I see, yes, there's an arm raised down here. And here comes the microphone, David. And if you did, if you want to introduce yourselves and give your organization, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, David That's a very interesting thought. Thank you very much. I'm going to start at the other end. Charles, your observations on that? Uh, that's a really interesting point. And I, I'll answer it sort of specifically within food, which is something we've, we've sort of researched on, uh, on in Oxford. And doing investigations, actually both for health labelling and for environmental uh, labelling. And it does do some good. Um, it does change the dial a bit, but a relatively small number of people are motiva motivated enough to do it. Um, you will know the example of the soda tax, which was put in in, in a way that actually, um, and actually my community is seen to be put in the wrong way. It had a major effect, but almost completely through reformulation by the industry making, making those rules. And some of these things, um, I suspect it might be the same with environmental labels as well. 
um, that it will make more difference by changing um, in, uh, environmental practice, um, industry practice. Uh, I worry that government um, assumes that the consumer can do a substantial amount of the heavy lifting on that uh, by education, by nudges, whatever. And the evidence tends to show that is not right and that it is a cop out for government to assume that they don't have to do things such as uh, shaping the boundary condition of the, of the market to incentivize the private sector uh, to do the right thing. Thank you very much. And I've had a comment for, from online from George Palmer, so he better pay attention, saying that he it wasn't easy to hear that question. So just to repeat it for our online participants, this is about practical steps that we can do and giving us a much better sense of what is effective in reducing our carbon footprint uh, and what is less effective. Uh, Ian, over to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a very, it's a very good point. Um, and, you know, if I reflect on when I go into a supermarket, um, and want to buy stuff, um, how much information do I have about the sustainability of the stuff that I'm buying? Uh, and it's almost none at all. Um, and actually, that yeah. information exists, and it could be delivered. Um, it, Charles is right, whether people will actually use it or not is another matter. But that's a, that's a cultural thing, and we do need to work on that. I think we can work on that at institutional scales because, um, again, just using the illustration of my own institution, uh, most of our carbon footprint, well, a very large part of our carbon footprint is in our procurement. And, um, you know, procurement mm. policy driven through an institutional structure mm. that says, OK, you have, two, you have two criteria upon which you make a judgment of what you buy. There's the cost of it, the financial cost, but there's also an environmental cost. And you have two budgets and you have to trade them off. And, and you know, people are perfectly uh, capable of doing that. But do we have the accounting systems to be able to make that happen? No, we don't. Um, I, I suspect that the market is going to deliver them eventually. Uh, but I would love to be able to implement accounting, an accounting system at the University of St Andrews that said to people, you have two budgets. You have a carbon budget and you have a financial budget and you have to work on both of them. Um, and that would make a huge difference. It wouldn't solve the problem, mm. but it would make a huge difference. And I think we could do that much more generally through the population by providing people with the information they need to make better decisions. And we don't right. do it. And we could do it quite easily through regulation uh, but the data almost certainly exists now. And it's a big data problem, but the data almost ex certainly exists. Yeah, now. very interesting. Thank you. And Barbara? Um, of course, we've got to think about this against the background of Boris having said that behaviour change by the public won't be required. It will be done by technology <laughs> and policy. Um, I, I mean, I'm a great fan of, of what David's doing at the Behaviour Insight Unit. Um, but for me, the most important thing is that this is this is a big, hairy problem, and it actually needs what I call a basket of instruments to surround it. You know, at the moment, we've not got sufficient thinking across government about how all of the instruments, all the tools in the toolkit are deployed around taking forward solutions to problems. So, for example, uh, when I was a regulator at the Environment Agency, it, it wasn't just about information and advice, it was about regulation, it was about incentives, it was about taxation and other fiscal and trading instruments. Um, all of those had to surround a problem in order to shift it. And we have just not got that thinking across government. And that's why I made the point about Treasury, because that's where that sort of thinking ought to sit. And it's not happening at the moment. And, you know, David will probably correct me, but the fact that the government gave up his unit and privatised it, Shows, either shows that they didn't think it was as important as they first thought, which I absolutely um, reject because I think we've really got to get the climate set for behavior change to be easy for people. Uh, I think he still has his uh, influence, Bob. Um, I'm going to move actually to our online participants because, of course, we will have an opportunity. Um, over dinner to carry on. Uh, but there's a, an, an online, online question, question uh, in, in fact, fact, an interaction between James Smith and Patrick McHugh, which is very relevant to, to what, what people, people have just been saying, which is, are we ready for the project management challenge of implementing net zero? Um, 
it's a, a critical path needs to be defined and is incredibly difficult. Option management, contingency planning. Uh, then there's a response from Patrick McHugh saying it's not just simply project management, uh, to which James had said, um, yes, it, with the project management I have in mind would need to include things like probabilistic modeling and link actions to outcomes. Uh, and there's separately a bit of it, maybe you just regard this as part of the science and technology stuff, which be attaching too much weight in, but there's a lot of interest in digital twins, the extent to which you can model and understand the full interrelationships in a system in order to act effectively. Do uh, the members of our panel think this is a, uh, an attractive approach which we should take? Ian, why don't we start with you? Well, I, I mean, it, it, it plays to what I was talking about in terms of the machinery of government. I mean, let, let, me, let me kind of come back to that a bit, because what do I really mean by that? Well, uh, you know, I, I think that the way government is, is dealing with this, um, and by the way, I, I agree with Barbara that, you know, it, it, all departments should be able to um, state clearly um, what they are doing with respect to getting to net zero and those sorts of things. Um, uh, but is that enough? And I think that, that um, uh, the, the questions uh, illustrate the fact that actually it probably isn't enough because this is a massive project. I mean, I've called it a project, but it's actually, it, it's, it's, it's something that's, that's bigger than running a government department. It's something probably bigger than running the treasury at the moment. It's something that the government needs to take up um, in, a, in a very wholesome way. And so in terms of machinery of government, we need something that is going to do that for us. We need to something that runs that project, uh, that does the modeling, that does, does the, uh, the, the digital twins. Um, and it, it's completely absent. It's all ad hoc um, at, at the moment. And that is not going to do. It's not going to allow us to get our, our arms around this problem. Um, uh, and we need to change it as quickly as possible. Very interesting. Very salutary. Uh, Charles? Uh, well, to, to try and be glass half full, then I think the Climate Change Committee does do a really good mm -hmm. job of uh, giving a pathway uh, forward. Uh, I really agree with Ian, though, that we need the sort of technical apparatus in order to be able to um, plan in more detail. And whether you call it the digital twin or not, we just need to get all the spatial um, resources that we have here in a, in a tool that can be, can be used much better. And you can criticize Dominic Cummins for many things, but he was right about just how difficult it is for central government to have access to that type of information. And I should say that when Ian was CSA at DEFRA, he was really pushing on initiatives uh, in that, which are still going on now. And finally, at the risk of sort of becoming, I agree with Barbara again, yeah. about the for David, of this from with that, you have Bayes, for example, talking about energy policy, but can't say anything about fiscal measures because it would upset Treasury. Similarly, um, DEFRA or Department of Health talking about diet, but can't say anything about uh, uh, um, about bringing in a, a carbon tax on food or something like that, because Treasury so so greatly guards the uh, it, it, its taxing. And of course, Treasury have done some interesting things recently. They commissioned the Das Gupta report, and they're looking at the Green Book and yep. how to bring in natural capital yep. in that. But yet, does it really believe in its heart of hearts that climate change? is as important as I suspect most of us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Barbara, your views, your views on that? Well, you know, channeling my inner chairman Mao, I would love <laughs> to see us have a series of five-year plans or a program management approach or, you know, we or a war footing even, you know. Um, there are examples of when nations of the world have actually harnessed huge energy and got on with something because they've faced an existential threat i'd love i'd love that um so if anybody would like to elect me as chairman Mara, i'd be <laughs> grateful but i don't think it's going to happen and i the one thing i worry about in, in terms of machinery of government is um the kind of well over to you if you're the department of making sure climate change doesn't happen um that means we can get off the hook mm. so i think 
Um, the Climate Change Committee is crucial, absolutely crucial. And John Deben has played a blinder. Mm. And, you know, the yep. next chairman of the Climate Change Committee must be incontrovertible, brave, resolute, wise, crafty in the way that he's been. Um, I, I bet, I, I guess he doesn't get invited to very many Conservative parties anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think that we need the Treasury to be absolutely centre stage, and I do think we need more joining up, so keep plugging away at that, because if we don't get joined up government around this very strong threat, we will not crack it. Yeah, I, I think, as I, as I was set, Charles Griffith, looking at it from how the Treasury see it, I mean, there is there some good news. I mean, uh, they have been involved in this analysis that shows, although substantial investment is required to get to net zero, for the UK alone, something over a trillion pounds between now and 2050. They've also been very taken by the evidence of operational savings that are generated by this investment, uh, which tend to accrue particularly in transport. Um, so they've got them, uh, and if you want to get Treasury action, the Treasury seeing a return on this investment, including in ways that they themselves can can measure is really useful getting them into the right place. Uh, that's the good news. I mean, the less good news is that there are a host of really tricky distribution issues which they are wrestling with. Um, if you, domestic heating is an area which is a, a much higher proportion of, of, of uh, living costs for less affluent households than for more affluent households. Um, but there are, there are kind of convenient price mechanisms or tax mechanisms you could use there, but they, they don't work, they're not progressive. So you then need to create some compensation adjustment through the benefit system, which immediately makes them more nervous. Um, uh, so that's, that inhibits action. And they, they are beginning to share some of this thinking in documents around the budget and at Resolution Foundation, we, they, we share some of the thinking with them. So, they are engaging with it, but it's probably not as open and uh, probably not shared sufficiently across government uh, as it should be. Uh, but they have, they are, they are definitely much more focused on all this than they were even a year ago. And you find they're sort of starting to engage in kind of exactly how much does how much does installing heat exchange system work? And indeed, are very focused on the point that the reason why at least two green deals have collapsed has been because of insufficient investment in the training and skills needed to actually implement them. And that uh, there's a really uh, important practical point to be done in, in terms of skills investment. Um, I'm gonna, as we're running out of time, I'm just going to give one other question from our participants online, which is another big topic. It could be an entire FST debate in its own right. It's from David Delpy. Uh, about the effects of population growth. And probably more importantly, the increasing growth of the middle classes in all populations, since they have a much bigger carbon footprint. What do we think about that incredibly fraught, delicate issue? Are we simply, through population growth globally, putting too great a burden on the world? And let's face it, the middle classes of China and India, if they try to if anything like the way the middle classes in the West live with meat consumption and travel are going to have a massive carbon uh, footprint. Uh, Barbara, any observations on that? I think it's an absolutely central point. I think there are two aspects of it. One is international population growth. Um, I think there are lots and lots of reasons why limiting the size of families internationally through education of women and empowerment of women is a Fairly splendid thing, and we're not sufficiently mm. serious about that yep. uh, in many places. I think back here, um, um, we we we've seriously got to question how many folk we can see the population of this country rising by, uh, and still keep at the carrying capacity of the more densely packed bits of the country, uh, particularly in the southeast. Uh, I know it's a really um, difficult topic to deal with mm. because it impacts on issues like immigration, but also um, 
the very real issue that the biggest growth of people already here is it is in our immigrant populations and i'm not anti-immigration and i absolutely uh, believe that the diversity of our population in this country is a huge strength and, and a huge benefit to us um, but we've got to face up to these difficult problems and not sheer away from talking about them uh, because the reality is in the UK, nobody has found a way of getting everybody to go to Aberdeen yet. <laughs> they've been watching the weather forecast over the last week. They never will go to Aberdeen. Yeah. So the, yeah. I'm going to get in terrible trouble. The Aberdeen Press and Journal has this ongoing hate campaign against me because I once said that climate change was the only thing that would make Aberdeen in Aberdeen. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologise to the people of Aberdeen. But the reality is um, we've got to stop being really mouthed about population issues, both globally and uh, uh, nationally. How we solve the problem of everybody wanting to eat meat and chicken, mm -hmm. yeah. I really don't know. And it is a bit much if we, having had, yeah. you know, we be, having been carnivorous for many, many years, um, start pulling up the drawbridge and saying, you lot have got to stay as plant eaters. I mean, that just is going to be unconscionable. Um, uh, but I do, uh, and I do think this is another thought that gets me into terrible trouble, that we must not forget that he, the human race is basically omnivorous. You know, let's not kid ourselves that we're going to be stamping out all um, meat eating and animal eating. Uh, it just ain't going to happen. The reality is that for the last zillions of centuries we've been omnivorous and we are not going to shift from that. But we can make a huge difference by even minor changes in our eating habits. And we've got yeah. to get on with the ones that, that we do. I mean, I'm virtually meat free now, but I'm not going to give up the odd bit of lamb. Okay, yes, I must check what we're eating this <laughs> evening. I'm, I'm worrying. Uh, and incidentally, I, I think there, there is a very interesting prospect. I think that cellular agriculture, plant-based uh, meats, uh, synthetic biology, there is enormous potential there. And one issue down the track where, again, there's a public policy lever, and you can already see this debate emerging in America, and we'll get it in the EU and perhaps in the UK, is whether these products can be branded as and defined as meat or whatever. And if we allowed them, if you allow uh, someone in plant-based agriculture producing meat to call their meat steak that would be a massive advance where of course the existing agricultural industry will fight very hard to stop it being allowed to take traditional designations and it will be a very interesting policy debate that i think will affect our ability to innovate in food production so maybe ian i better get you to you better comment on that or anything else well, we've, got, we've gone from the high population yeah, to all the, these issues the, the, the question is really around population but uh, <laughs> barbara mentioned food and she mentioned aberdeen and actually lives in aberdeen. Anyway, it's, it's kind of nice. um, uh, I, I mean just just to cover off the food i mean i don't think there's any doubt that, you know, <laughs> enough food to eat the to planet for quite a long time into the future if if we do it in a certain kind of way um and there but there are massive trade-offs and through trade-offs as as you know are with biodiversity and um uh, and, and so there's a, there's a there's a cost there there's a major cost there uh, and then we have with respect to um sort of uh, uh, substitute meats and things like that we have good old jevons paradox which which means oh. that you know if we if we start calling these things steak then it probably just drives up the whole consumption of steak overall so we have we have a number of we have a number of real challenges sitting there but go, going to david's um, question about about population i mean i agree uh, with with what barbara said i, I, I this, I, is, a, I, this immensely is a immensely complex immensely problem um uh, and i i but frankly you know i think i think that there are there's a lot about um uh, aid to developing countries which which i don't agree with uh, very much but but there are some things i do agree with and that's that empowering women uh, to make better decisions about their lives is uh, is is a universally good thing to do and and it is probably the key to the population problem i mean i'm i'm saying that without much knowledge of it but but i think there is a there's pretty good evidence that says that 
you know, the more empowered women are, the more a population problem um, is gets under control. Um, uh, that's maybe over oversimplifying it. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that we do have a local population problem in certain parts of the, of the UK. We are one of the densest populations in the world. That, you know, um, we, have, we have a very high population density, in, in, particularly in, in the southeast. Uh, and, and the natural resources that we have available to us are really getting stressed. And, and I, I think, though, that um, we will start coming up against population limits um, in various places, um, maybe in the southeast, but actually certainly in the developing world, uh, relatively soon. And, and, and I think we're already coming up against them, and we're seeing it with respect to the immigration problems that we've got. So we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't think that a lot of the problems associated with population are some some way down the road. I think we're already seeing them, um, and and they, they they crop up in all sorts of um, uh, ultimate forms, whether it's migrants coming across the channel or whatever it might be. Um, but actually, the drivers behind this are things about resource availability, resource consumption, um, uh, you know, and, and, and access to those resources um, in, in their home countries. And, um, uh, and, and it, it is simply just going to get worse unless we actually get it under control. Thank you very much. And Charles, the, the last word in bringing the threads together. And, and I'll be brief about this. So I genuinely tell my students I'm more optimistic today than when I was their age, despite quite saying not coming to the fore, despite something and whatever. And the reason this might be a familiar background, I'm Professor of Population Biology at Oxford. And go back 30 years ago, and we did not have an intellectual argument against Malthus that population would uh, inevitably uh, outrun our capacity to feed it. But we now know, and Ian's exactly right, we now know that if we bring people out of poverty, which is a good thing, if we educate their children, especially girls, if we provide access to reproductive health care, then human fertility goes down. And there is not a particular reason why that should have happened. It is a fabulous get out of jail card. And of course, the, the middle class will go up, but the middle class go, is not going up exponentially. It is intellectually um, feasible now to talk at a time when humanity's footprint on the environment will plateau and go down. And I don't think that was possible in the 70s during the time of the Club of Rome and time of um, the pop, Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb. And it really makes sense. We know what we need to do on population and um, we should just get on and do it. Well, what a fascinating and important note on which to end. Thank you very much, Charles. And thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>